much. Um, you'll have to forgive me a little bit because I've got a cold, so my American accent is going to come out even more nasally than it normally does. Um, I want to qualify some of this talk by saying I'm not a proper archaeologist. Um, I'm more of a glorified art historian with an interest in heritage. Um, and I've just recently submitted my PhD at the University of Leicester. Uh, and this talk is based on a very small part of that research about the city of Ravenna uh, in Italy. So this research attempted to combine elements of body history with a critique of how vision and the gaze have been written about in order to question whether modes of viewing are trans-historical or if they're period-specific, and then apply this understanding to how we present heritage landscapes to the public today. And among the many questions that interest me is whether or not there is an empirical method for recreating how things looked in the past. And as many of you might know, this is a long-standing theoretical debate in visual culture studies. So with this session, we've been talking a lot about how time can be made visual. Uh, and producing a single paradigm for that is somewhat tricky work, as we've seen with lots of the brilliant papers here today. Some of this is because, as John Berger showed us, that ways of seeing are many and multiple, but equally, theories about ways of seeing are many and multiple. Uh, and in my work, I've agreed most with Alison Chirac, who I've not put on the slide, sorry about that, who said that viewing is fragmentary, but so too are the paradigms in which we discuss viewing. So how do our eyes make sense of things? Uh, and most of the time, it's with the help of additional information. So these are our own personal biases, like education and culture, and especially our place in time. So we imprint upon an image with our own knowledge, but in some periods of the past, images imprinted themselves upon the viewer through the act of looking. This paper is going to explore the complexities of viewing in the past by focusing on tourist attitudes toward built environment in Italy in the 18th century. So this is a sort of double layered exploration um, of looking at late antique and early medieval visual culture through the eyes of the grand tour. And these are two extremely different modes of viewing. In late antiquity and the early middle ages, viewing is heavily scriptural and theological. Uh, but more than that, looking was a physical act. Eyes could touch and images could touch eyes. Images were powerful in the literal sense. They actually contain power like the power of God. And this is most exemplary in Byzantine, um, Byzantine icon theory, where worshippers prayed to an icon of a saint or a martyr to ask them to intercede with God on their behalf. So their eyes must touch the image in order for it to make an impression and become knowledge, and then looking became a way to know the divine. But by the time of the Grand Tour, uh, ideas about viewing had shifted fairly radically no longer were icons and images containers of power, they're more markers of decoration, which are helpful for demonstrating stories, uh, but not so much for talking to a saint. We can take as one example this well-consulted art historian at the time of the Grand Tour making a comment about the image of the Holy Ghost as a dove. So he suggests that ancient images are nothing more than a way to render sensible to the eye the invisible power of God and that over time, these images became part of a truth about the connection between symbols and their meaning. Uh, so the association of the Holy Spirit with the form of a dove was quite canonical in theological imagery, uh, having come from a New Testament story of the dove descending upon Jesus after his baptism. And you can see that here uh, on the left in uh, this late antique baptistry scene. Uh, and you can see another image of the dove as the Holy Ghost in this Rubens painting from the 16th century. So what I like about this quote is that I think it demonstrates some of the complexities of time and visual material. It's a historic text that's commenting on even more historic material. Uh, and today we might read more of Tori with a grain of salt, but he makes a particular judgment about past images and past viewers from a standpoint that he believes is modern, scientific, and valid. Uh, but simply because modern people might not think that an image contains the literal power of God does not mean that that mode of viewing is invalid in the past. An expression of a mode of viewing is viewing, if you follow me there. So generally speaking, <clears throat> we can say that viewing is both period specific and person specific. And this is where talking about bodies in time becomes relevant. Ravenna, the former capital of the late Roman and early Byzantine empires, is a useful case study for exploring modes of viewing through time because it has so much visual material. Uh, in its original context inside of these late antique basilicas. <coughs> it's 
standing buildings lend themselves well to an investigation of viewing and interaction through clues within their architecture that signpost to the ways that people might have moved around these spaces and interacted with artwork and other specific foci. Um, I've also examined some text uh, to see how responses to these images and the structures that house them shifted from veneration in late antiquity to skepticism and deconstruction in the modern era. Grand tour narratives provide an interesting insight into the beginning of modern tourism, and they reveal British attitudes toward European art and architecture during the height of the Enlightenment. Travelers were touring and appreciating Italy's churches as pieces of antiquity, and with this appreciation came the Enlightenment's sense of reasoning and classification. Today, much of our tourism is mapped out by points of visual interest and historic value, and much of this began with the Grand Tour. So for anyone who might be unfamiliar with it, the Grand Tour broadly refers to this period between the mid-16th and the early 19th century, when it was common for young people to embark upon a tour of Europe, which basically meant France and Italy and maybe a little bit of um, Germany or Greece if you could afford it, searching for art, architecture, and culture. Now usually, but not always, they were British, and usually, but not always, they were male, and definitely always, they're wealthy and well-educated. So the fact that these travelers are mostly British and mostly elites reflects a fusion of tourism and social status in these centuries. Travel was expensive, exclusive, and explicitly linked with concepts of personal fulfillment in ways that it hadn't been in other periods. So it should be perhaps uh, entirely unsurprising that a load of rich, br rich British blokes had a lot to say about their travels, uh, and a good deal of the Grand Tour literature survives in published form today. Uh, however, most of these accounts have very few good things to say about Ravenna. At this time, travel around the lower Po Delta was extremely difficult due to poor road conditions, and Ravenna was a much less appealing location than grander places like Venice, Florence, and Rome. And on top of that, it seemed to be derelict and falling down, as this quote uh, from Thomas Broderick perhaps demonstrates. The interest in going there is sort of to tick it off the list if you're already out on the Adriatic coast. So I'm going to use some of their observations about the Church of Spirito Santo in particular to demonstrate how stories were able to attach themselves to spaces and places because of the visual material available there. Place as location had deep associations with both holy legends and historic events, and as a result, many buildings changed names over time to reflect these stories and events. Spirito Santo has had at least four names that I can think of, and each of them represents a distinct phase in its history. It was originally built in the late 5th or early 6th century as Ravenna's Arian Cathedral, dedicated to the resurrection. It was rededicated to St. Theodore in the late 6th century after the Byzantine conquest. But by the 16th century, the Church of St. Theodore was called San Spirito, or the Holy Spirit, and its outer edifice was rebuilt using some of the late antique elements. Its name derives from a medieval legend about St. Severus, a local Ravenna bishop who was said to have been appointed by the Holy Spirit itself. The story goes that the Holy Spirit descended upon St. Severus in the form of a dove to signal his appointment as a bishop, and then did the same for 12 successive bishops of, of Ravenna. Uh, now, as mentioned, the holy dove was a common symbol, so it might have been easy to pick this up and attach it to a Ravenna story. We do have record of an 11th century sermon by a local priest that mentions this story, and it was so widespread by the early part of the 12th century that it was visually sanctioned in the new apse mosaic of Ravenna's main cathedral. However, why this building that was formerly the Cathedral of the Arians became the site of this legend and was given this designation is unclear. There are no sources that tell us that this is the building where Bishop Severus was appointed, nor that tell us when it changed names from St. Theodore to San Spirito in the intervening 10 centuries, although we might guess that it happened when the edifice was rebuilt. Uh, Mariette Beerhoven's extensive analysis of the church's history has noted that the association of this location with this legend is, in her own word, incomprehensible. This church is so tightly associated with this story by the 17th century that even local historians are unaware that the edifice is originally the Arian Cathedral. So the building has lost all of its original context up to the time just before the Grand Tour, and now new histories are free to attach itself to it. So what we have so far is a story, a popular theological image, and a building. And I've only been able to think of one thing that might connect the three of them, 
the addition of an ocular window in the new 16th century edifice. Churches of the Holy Spirit were built throughout Italy between the 14th and the 16th centuries. Uh, one was built in Florence, another in Siena, and one in Palermo, most notably. This small architectural element uh, appears in most of them, a round window in the facade of the central nave that perhaps could have been designated as the place where the holy dove flowed, flew, could fly through. Um, so it begs the question of whether or not this particular architectural feature led to the addition of the story in Ravenna, or if the facade of Spirito Santo was redesigned with this legend in mind. Granted, uh, ocular windows and their later medieval counterpart, the rose window, are a popular architectural choice in late medieval basilicas, uh, not just those designated as the Holy Spirit. Uh, as you can see, there's another small church in Ravenna called Santa Maria in Porto Fuori, which also has an ocular window. <coughs> so possibly I might suggest that Spirito Santo's new facade with the ocular window helped facilitate a link between place and legend simply by giving a visual cue. But for 18th century travelers on the Grand Tour, this legend about the Holy Dove is both miraculous and unbelievable. Some travelers were told the story by local people, like priests in the church, and others read about it by visual markers, like inscriptions. <clears throat> John Bravel said that strangers were usually shown the hole through which the dove entered, and remarked that this legend was backed by a pompous Latin inscription near the pulpit of the church. So if we think back on uh, Moriatori's comment earlier about image that, about with his insistence that images of the holy dove were only a way to make sense of the invisible, reveals this issue of making something invisible into something comprehensible through viewing. Visual material was a means for understanding both the story and the invisible power of God in late antiquity, and it makes the ephemeral more tangible. But in the 18th century, the Enlightenment sense of skepticism turned the act of looking into a means of scrutiny. However, I think the physical evidence of Spirito Santo kind of makes it a selling point whether you believe the story or not. <clears throat> Travelers could stand in front of it or outside of it and have someone point to the window while telling this miraculous story of Ravenna's early Christian history. Even if they scoffed, as Johann Kiesler did in his letters home, that the window is only the one through which it is pretended that the Holy Dove came, he still recorded it. And even if he didn't believe it, he still looked. And for many of the Ravennet locals, this story is true because their eyes tell them it's true. Here's the building, here's the window, there's the inscription. What more do you need? <clears throat> now, I realize that I've made a fairly distinct claim about a small amount of evidence and asked you all to believe that a hole in the wall is enough to create whole stories in place and time, but I've seen people do more with less, so it's okay. Um, I think that it demonstrates how spatial associations are loosely configured, uh, and they're very dependent upon time. So meaning can attach itself to a place if someone could stand there and visually make sense of an event happening in that location. And we've been handed down these multiple histories and multiple modes of viewing uh, from the late antique and early medieval images of the Holy Dove that helped create the legend originally, to the Enlightenment's emphasis on reason and learning over lore. We can look at this now as quite bad anthropology. We don't normally just arrive in other countries and tell them that all their stories are wrong and all their pictures are just pictures. But we can also acknowledge that viewing is fragmented and complicated. It's more than valid for multiple stories to exist in the same place. It's not that the medieval stories are wrong and Grand Tour deconstruction is right, it's that these are two separate ways of thinking about visual culture in two separate time periods. <clears throat> um, so to conclude, this analysis relies quite heavily upon who we believe are the meaning makers and how that relates to us. Is it the original builders of the building? Is it us as scholars who are creating scholarship through time? <clears throat> Is it the other historic periods that have written upon these images? Today, Spirito Santo, like most of Ravenna's churches, is a tourist site. The ceiling of its baptistry survives in testament to its original foundation and remains a popular stop. Uh, I would say today that there are a few tourists who would say they're visiting a church in order to commune with a saint, um, or pray at an altar, or light a votive candle, but there are surely few of us who will say that we're going there for personal enlightenment either. The tourist gaze today is rapidly changing how we interact with the past and with these images. So if you're ever wondering how people get these perfect textbook ceiling shots, uh, it's like this. <clears throat> but I think that um, 
These various modes of interaction are all perfectly valid. Together we create public knowledge and many modes of viewing by reading through time. We're actually seeing time. It's an impression of composite images of all of these various stories in one place. Thank you.